Okay, this time I didn't forget recording. <laughs> right, let's make a start. Excuse me, my voice is not great. It's early in the morning. Let me know if you have problems with my screen. That's going to be a long lecture, as you can see. <laughs> OK, guys, I hope everybody is doing well. <clears throat> this week, we are starting the theme of pedagogy. <clears throat> Only if I can talk. <clears throat> So pedagogy is not something that you don't know or something that is completely unfamiliar for you. Um, actually, we've been covering pedagogy since you came into early childhood. Um, the way we teach children, the way we help them to learn something is pedagogy. And so don't be surprised, this lecture is gonna be a combination of things that you already seen and you already know, but we will look into everything we've learned from level C, from level I, in terms of theories and pioneers and, and those kind of influences in early childhood from the pedagogy perspective today. It's gonna to be a very nice way of summarizing everything for you. Let's first start with what is pedagogy, because this is the bit that students always get confused. Pedagogy is just like a term that we use uh, for defining the way we teach. It's not what we teach, the way we teach, how we teach and how we support learning and development in children. For some reason, pedagogy and curriculum has been used as synonymously and they appear indistinguishable. But we should not confuse these two terms. A lot of people confuse it and they use it as the same way, but curriculum is only referring to the content that, um, that we are teaching. Pedagogy is um, referring to the full set of instructional techniques and strategies that enabled learning to take place in early childhood and providing opportunities for acquisition of knowledge skills, attitudes, and dispositions. So it's how we support the child, how we support the child's learning, not just in terms of academic learning, also how we support the child to acquire for knowledge, to acquire for different new set of skills, attitudes, and dispositions. Okay, so this is the, the techniques, the strategies that we use. So in England, as you, as you all well know, we rely on EYFS framework. So EYFS sets out the pedagogical approach that we need to refer to. In New Zealand, we have Tiwariki approach as a pedagogical approach. In different parts of the, con in, in parts of the world, we, we have some different frameworks which defines our pedagogical approach, which means, how do we teach children? It's not simply teaching or performance of curriculum delivery. So pedagogy is not just delivering what you need to deliver. It's not just teaching the content. It's not just teaching what you need to teach. It's not about the goals. It's the act of teaching. The act of teaching together with the theories that you believe about pedagogy the policies that drive your pedagogy and the challenges that shape your pedagogy. Okay, it's representing what practitioners actually do and think. So if a practitioner is in favoring child-led practice, if a practitioner is in favor of adult-led practice, if a practitioner is in favor of indoor learning, if a practitioner is in favor of outdoor learning, if a practitioner is in favor of group learning, if a practitioner is more in favor of individual learning, or if a practitioner is in favor of all of these altogether, what does practitioner think and actually do 
to follow this pedagogical approach. So pedagogy is our style, basically, in practice or teaching. Okay, it's our style. It's how we do things and what do we believe in. Do we believe children should be actively learning? Do we believe children should be passively receiving information from teachers and practitioners? Do we believe I should be involving families in my practice? These kind of things, all the decisions that you make about the way you teach children is related to the pedagogical approach that you take. So teaching is a part of pedagogy, but thinking is the heart of pedagogy. What do I think about how should I teach? What do you believe in child development and learning is the heart of your pedagogy because it, it's gonna shape your pedagogy. If you don't believe in the role of technology, you won't have a technology focused pedagogy. You won't use technology in your learning and teaching experience. So what you think is going to shape how you act with children, how, what do you do and what do you think about the way you teach children? So what is curriculum then? As I said, I, um, they, there's a lot of confusion between curriculum and pedagogy. Curriculum is the sum of total experiences, activities, events, whether direct or indirect, which occur within an environment designed to foster children's learning and development. So the things that we actually design activities, events, environmental sources that we give to children, how do we set the environment, how do we set rooms in, in a nursery setting, how do we set a classroom design in a school setting, um, the, ex the, the, the stimuli that we use, the sources that we use, and these kind of things are a part of the curriculum. It's kind of like the tools, you can imagine as the tools, our tools. So we designed the curriculum <clears throat> as a part of our pedagogical approach as well. So if we are following Montessori's teachings, and if we say, um, I am following Montessori's teachings, and this is my pedagogical approach is Montessori framework, then you will need to find a lot of natural resources because this is what Mont Montessori framework pedagogy entails, they, they say Montessori suggests using a lot of natural, colorful, made of wood, made of mm, natural materials kind of resources, not like toys or fancy toys or fancy um, things that we see in the market today, but very simple things. If you're following Montessori pedagogy, then you will need to provide a curriculum like that, or you will need to provide activities like that. If you're following Freud's pedagogy, then you will need to design activities outdoors as well as indoors, because he was a big fan of outdoors learning. So how does pedagogy came into shape? How pedagogy we use today or different types of pedagogy. There is not one type of pedagogy. We will cover these over the next weeks and in this one. So for instance, today we have a guest lecturer for the second lecture and she's a, she's a, she has a lot of practice in Reggio, Reggio Emilia approach. So she's gonna talk about observation, but just bear in mind, you can ask her questions about Reggio Emilia pedagogy as well. Pedagogy can be viewed as a body of theory and practices that draws on philosophy, psychology, social science, and it's developed over the past 300 years and more. It's quite rich. Since the moment we started talking about education and how can we improve education, the discussion about pedagogy started. That's why I'm telling you, you were already learning about pedagogy, but we never really use the term that much, so don't get confused. Everything we've learned so far is feeding into pedagogy. Ideas and concepts in pedagogy also comes from other fields, neuroscience, policy, research findings in different various subjects. So the moment we started discussing about how can we teach, how can we help children to learn better, the, then, then everything we did in order to understand and answer this question has fed into pedagogy. 
So pedagogy is not just relying on Freud, Bell, Steiner. These are not the first people who have created early childhood education and pedagogy. It was way before. So we need to talk about philosophers like Aristotle, Socrates, these people who were thinking about how we should be teaching. What is the meaning of teaching? What is the meaning of learning? They have also helped us to understand and the, to, to, to shape our pedagogy even today, even though their theories are quite older, they're still inspiring us today. Now, I'm gonna go over this very quickly, but you know, you have your slides and you can repeat it. So this will be a kind of like a roller coaster <laughs> summary over the pedagogical approaches that we learned from the pioneers that we covered in the first year. You will see, the timeline for early childhood, official timeline for early childhood, starts with the pioneers. And then we have theorists that we are covering more in level I, like Vygotsky, Brunner, Rogoff, you know, Piaget. These people are later. But first we had influences from pioneers. Pioneers and theorists are different. Pioneers have created their own educational framework. They had a clear idea of how education should be in early years or in the later years, and they set up us framework. So these people all have a manifesto, you might say. Theorists, they, they have theories. They have theories about development and learning, which is something different. They didn't really design educational systems. Piaget didn't design educational system. Why Gotsky didn't design an educational system unlike Freud Bell did or Montessori did? What they did is they offered us some ways of understanding how children develop and learn. So theorists and pioneers are different. There's a reason these people are called pioneers because they pioneered our first knowledge of education and how it should be because they offered some systems they are different than theories. And the, what they offered is not very testable. You can just follow it and you can see if it's working. But a theory of something like what Piaget offered, where the children are, are in the preoccupational stage in, in the, those ages, we can test it. We can do an experiment and test it. But educational systems offered by pioneers, we can't test it. So let's have a look at what has influenced pedagogy in early, early years? Let's, let, this is gonna be like a timeline for you, timeline of theorists and pioneers who have particular influence in the development of, again, I need to underline this as well, Western early years pedagogy. We're not talking about the other parts of the world here. This is majority Western early years pedagogy. So the practice, early years practice and pedagogy, first understanding of our pedagogy started with Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who said that young children should be allowed to develop free of society's constraints and that provision for them should provide a balance between freedom and happiness. On the one hand, increasing independence and control on the other. So we have, we have rooted the seeds of early childhood, thanks to John Jacques Rousseau, who said that young children should be allowed to have, allowed to, basically he tried to help us understand young children are not mini adults. As you know from level C, we said that young children was not always seen as children, they were seen as mini version of adults. So Rousseau said, no, I don't agree with this. Childhood is a different timeline and I want them to have independence, but also have happiness. We need to take into account that they should not like be adults. And in the timeline, we, we continue with Pestalozzi, the Swiss educational reformer. He has a huge influence on primary education mainly. And then we have Freubel, a German educator who introduced the concept of the kindergarten and introduced outdoor learning pedagogy to us. Then we have John Dewey, a theorist who is generally held to be responsible from gradual shift from school centered towards a more child centered pedagogy. So thanks to John Dewey, now we know that our educational 
frameworks should be more child-centered, especially in the early years. And Montessori, who is an Italian educator and doctor, introduced the Montessori method, who is well known for this method even today, based on the child-centered, not child-led principles. So Montessori is slightly different. Um, Montessori method remains in evidence and settings across the world. So this is more like a timeline for you, okay? So I'm just gonna correct myself. I said there is no theories, but we have John Dewey in there. So um, as you can see, pioneers were quite earlier, uh, but then there were one or two, two theories in between as well. We go along in the timeline, later in the timeline, in the UK, we have Macmillan sisters, Rachel and Margaret, Mac, uh, Macmillan sisters, who were committed to social welfare of children. So these Macmillan sisters, they were not just interested in learning and teaching, they were interested in creating a good social environment, a clean, because on those times that we had, we had, we had pandemics, we had uh, hygiene problems and these kind of things, which were not really allowing children to have the best learning experience. So Macmillan sisters had a more holistic approach, I might say, saying that they need to reform the social welfare of children. So they said that children learn most effectively when they are well fed and clothed and the learning environment is organized. So these are the times education was really struggling because there were a lot of health problems in the society. There were a lot of cleaning hygiene related problems and therefore the viruses were much common in that times. Macmillan and sisters had said, okay, a time for a social reform with those problems we can't really teach children. So they had a bit of holistic approach. Um, and Steiner, an Austrian philosopher and scientist, developed the philosophical doctrine of anthros anthroposophy, emphasizing the spiritual growth of the human being through educational process of doing, thinking, and feeling. So as you know today, Steiner, Waldorf schools, you might, you might know the other term, Waldorf schools, are quite a thing even today because they have an approach, a different approach to early childhood um, and their pedagogy says, we need to see children as spiritual beings, which is quite right. The, their education process is not just about learning passively. They need to do things. They need to think on their own. They need to feel things. And Steiner schools, you can also hear the term Waldorf schools are widely recognized in England. We have also Susan Isaacs, which you know very well from Bolton, England, who has a very significant influence over our pedagogy as well in early years practice. Um, she has emphasized the role of play and value of child observations. So these are just some of the names. I know I'm missing some of the, some of them, and not everyone is here. A few of them are missing, but this is more like a timeline for you. So you see, pedagogy has been created thanks to all these people. Everyone has contributed something. Not all of them are perfect by itself, but all of them have contributed something in our understanding about how we should teach children, how we should help children to learn, how we should educate them. Right, so, okay, let's go on to theories that help shape and shaping the pedagogy. Are we okay so far? Is everybody, is anybody confused? Sorry, I said everybody. Any questions, anything, I'm happy to pause and go over because this is a little bit um, crowded lecture today. Now, there is a little bit of repetition for you because I know Level I Core is also covering this. Level I, level I Core, over the last two weeks, we've been covering constructivist and behaviorist very intensely. Now, this is a time for you to take this theories that we've covered into practice. Okay, now you're gonna make a link between those theories and you will now see, why are we learning Piaget so much? I mean, okay, he has some interesting theory, but why, how does it help us? I'm gonna be working with children. How does Piaget's theory help me? Piaget's theory help you because his theory 
and all the other developmental perspectives, these are developmental perspectives of pedagogy, helped shaping our understandings in pedagogy as well, helped shaping a lot of things in practice. So let's have a look at what Piaget was saying. As a constructivist, Piaget was saying that children progress in developmental stages. And each developmental stage, children have a certain set of skills. Sorry. Oh, thanks guys. Thanks guys for the nice feedback. Okay, so children are learning different skills in each developmental stage. This is what Piaget says. And the other main things that Piaget say, don't get lost in the stages that he offers. You don't really need to know those stages inside out. All you need to know when you write about Piaget in your essays, nobody expects you to write about stages, okay guys? We always find that. All you need to know about Piaget is what actually he's thinking about the way children are learning. So Piaget is very much like a kind of like a sciencey person, okay? You need to understand he is on the side of cognitive development. That's why his theory is called cognitive development theory. Because he said that children are very curious creatures and they are always motivated to explore around and construct their knowledge on their own construct the, the ideas about the world on their own. Okay, so Piaget said children are active explorers, they are constructing the knowledge on their own, they, they kind of explore ideas like a little scientist. How does it help us in terms of practice, what Piaget said? First of all, Piaget's ideas have been very helpful in creating stimulating environments. Because Piaget thinks children are discovering things like scientists, that means we need to provide things to children to discover. We need to spark curiosity in children. That means we need to create a very stimulating, appropriate environment, which will help them explore things. When you go to a setting in a nursery, you will see the settings are quite interesting. You will see lots of toys, different corners, for different type of play. These are all based on Piaget's ideas. So you see how Piaget has actually supported, has actually in, contributed to our knowledge of pedagogy. And also, if you look at the nurseries, especially, you see that children are grouped in the playrooms by age. So sometimes I join Zoe when she drops Elia, her daughter, to the nursery. So in the Elia, as she grow, um, she went into the upstairs because her age, when she when you grow, the toddlers, infants they are in different groups, in different age age groups, and in different playrooms in nurseries. This is the way they, this is designed. That's also very much influenced by Piaget's linear stage theory, because Piaget said that a child who is between zero and two years old is going to have different cognitive skills than a child who is between two and four years old. So nurseries and practices followed Piaget's developmental stages and that's why they separated. They separated the age groups into playrooms. So this is how Piaget's theory has fed into our practice today. Also, Piaget's focus on the child's active exploration and movement through the process of assimilation and accommodation. You can also see this in the, in the way practitioners place or provide resources and create rich environments and try to create opportunities for children to explore as they choose. Because as children explore more, they have more chance to practice either assimilation or accommodation which is the key of learning for Piaget. But simply following Piaget is not enough because Piaget, if we just follow Piaget, we will rely on environment a little bit too much. We will rely on active exploration of the child a little bit too much. We need to balance things. Have a look at the other ones who could feed our pedagogy. For instance, well-known Vygotsky's theory. Again, we've been covering this in Devil Lie. Actually, this is a good timing. So you do, I don't really need to explain things again because you've been covering in the other side of the course. But we said that 
in our seminars, actually, we worked a lot on this. We said that Vygotsky is also a constructivist. He believes that children make their knowledge on their own. I always give you the example of construction workers who are creating a building for scraps. So children are the same. They are working like a construction worker. They create something from zero. Because, um, because he believes that, Vygotsky is also constructivist, but he's slightly different than Piaget. Piaget is believing in the role of environment as a way of you know, materials, stimuli, exploring things, existing objects and things like that. But Vygotsky is pretty much a very social world person. He believes children construct knowledge in the social world. Children do problem solving with others, to negotiate with others, make meaning of experiences through knowledgeable others, such as teachers, such as parents or peers who would know more than them. And he has this very important concept of zone of proximal development, which influenced our learning as well a lot. We use it a lot. Zone of proximal development is one of the most important concepts that Vygotsky has given us and we use in practice and, and we, we build our pedagogy around this, around this uh, knowledge, which means that we need to be aware of child's existing level of knowledge. And we need to assist the child to reach to the next level of knowledge. When we look at Rogoff, who is also a social constructivist, he extended Vygotsky's zone of proximal development. And he proposed the concept of guided participation. I'm pretty sure you're covering this in core as well, but don't, don't be alarmed. We definitely recover Rogoff a lot in the Y core too. And he, she prov provides a more inclusive framework to understand children's active participation. And Rogoff is actually is one of the people that who, who has fed into ideas like shared sustained thinking. Um, and she also took into account the role of culture. And actually this is something we don't really talk enough. Um, in the UK is a very multicultural setting and, and taking into account different cultures of, of children in our setting is a constant challenge simply because practitioners come from a different culture sometimes and children come from another culture. Rogoff's teachings have really helped us to understand how we can find a midway in this rich cultural environment. Both Vygotsky's and Rogoff's ideas are very significant for early years practice and pedagogy because they helped us a lot in order to create environments that children are actively participating in order to create environments that children are supported in their zone of proximal development, not led or con controlled, just supported and guided. Okay, let's have a look at another developmental perspective. Again, you are covering this in course, so I don't need to go into details of it. Behaviorism. Behaviorism. As you know, we talked about conditioning, reinforcement, we talked about punishment. Behaviorism, who has roots in John Locke's, Watson's, Pavlov's, and Skinner's works, it's a very experimental side of psychology. And actually psychology has, has built on those experimental, experimental studies. They, they were the official, official beginnings of psychology, although psychology work goes back to very older times somehow the literature of psychology accepts these kind of experimental studies in the beginning. It, they, they just didn't, need psych, didn't feed only psychology, they also fed our knowledge in earliest practice because we apply what we learned from behaviorism to earliest practice intensely even today. What do we apply? First, we know that children learn through reinforcement and sometimes punishment as well. Although we debate the punishment, whether we use it or not, that's a very controversial topic right now. It has been known in the past, from the past studies that reinforcement or punishment have an effect. 
whether this effect is good or not, we can discuss, depends on the nature of the reinforcement and the punishment. So according to the principles of behaviorism, a learning is acquired, which means someone or something outside is creating your learning rather than you, rather than your innate, innate learning process. And behaviorists also say that stimuli for learning in the environment are critical. So things we provide for reinforcing children or things we provide for conditioning children, according to behaviorists, these are very important because children make an association between one stimuli and the consequences that follows it. So behaviorists created sort of an importance over the environment, which we still use some of the principles. We use reinforcement a lot. We use rewards in practice a lot. We don't, we shouldn't really use punishment in a very reckless way, but there are some, some cases, pedagogies that also rely different, different punishment styles as well. But this is something really even today used. Behaviorism is not in the back of the books. It's still influencing the practice today. We have someone who has challenged and developed the behaviorism further. That is Bandura. So Bandura's theory is somewhere between, I would say, behaviorism and the social constructivism. But um, so Bandura is, is, is within the behaviorist theory, but because he said that environment causes behavior as the only thing that changes behavior is environment is very simple. According to Bandura, he said, no, this is just too very simplistic way of understanding children's or any, any person's behavior. His theory was not just about children, by the way. He was also talking about adults. So in his social learning theory, he said that it's not just the environment. It is, environment is definitely a major player in the game, but children learn through observation and imitation of significant others. Children learn by observing parents, carers, educators, peers. Children learn by imitating educators, peers, parents, carers. So he kind of said, actually, children have an active role by observing and by imitating. But similar to behaviorists, he took into account the role of environment as well. He just took it to further. And his idea, uh, the role of uh, observation and imitation, how important it's very much alive in the practice today. We do know that children learn from others a lot, even though we don't even realize it. And we still use that important theory in our practices today. What else we know? And developmental perspectives. We also know about Bowlby's theory of attachment. Theory of attachment is really controversial um, because a lot of people are finding it again, too simplistic, too deterministic. Oh, just because your mom didn't have a healthy relationship with you, you're an insecure relation, insecure attached. This kind of explanations have been found very simplistic by some other researchers, but nevertheless, Bowlby's attachment theory has made a huge contribution to our understanding of the significance of early relationships we form in childhood. Thanks to Bowlby, thanks to also Ainsworth and Bell and other people who developed Bowlby's work, we now know that our understanding of relationships, the way we form relationships in our early years, is very important for our relationships in the adult years as well. And that's why we know that a lot of, a lot of therapists, a lot of uh, psychotherapy era, psychotherapy approaches are focusing on childhood because resolving the issues that we learned from childhood are the way we understand about relationships from childhood is going to make a huge impact about our uh, adulthood lives. Um, this is a very significant contribution from Bowlby. And that's why 
thanks to Volby, we have the key person system in EYFS. You know, the key person system is acquiring, is, is requiring us for children who are young children come to the practice, they are assigned to a key person, a person they can attach with, they can form a good working close relationship. Um, the Bowlby's work was challenged and extended with other researchers, but still very much influencing our practice today. And that theory, Bowlby's theory actually has created a lot of debate in the field, such as, shall we take care of our children at home by ourselves? Because clearly attachment theory is very important. Or shall we let earlier settings to take care of our children? If the attachment in the early years is very important, like they say in Bowlby's work, why are we sending our children away to nurseries and practices to spend majority of the day with a stranger who is not parent? There was, there was so heated debates about this subject, but they are kind of like a past thing because one thing you need to understand about Bowlby's work is children do not attach to only one person. They can be attached to multiple people at the same time, including their fathers, including their siblings, including the relatives, including the key person, including their pets. So we have more understanding about Bowlby's work, but still nevertheless very influential in the practice today. Who else contributed to our pedagogical understanding? Brunner contributed to earlier's practice through providing more understanding about our cognitive development. He said that our cognitive development have modes of representation. I will not explain too much because I know you're going through these in detail in level I. Inactive, iconic, and symbolic. So Bruna has also contributed to our practice. And because we know that a child could be having iconic representation, a child will be having symbolic representation that will help us to design our environments and materials. Brunner also developed Vygotsky's zone of proximal development theory further, and he introduced a very important, very important concept, which is called scaffolding, which is very important in practice today. So according to scaffolding, if we want children to learn something, we need to provide guidance. That is one step ahead of the child. A guidance that will push the child to go to the one step further. Okay, so scaffolding is Brunner's theory. Don't think it's Vygotsky's. Vygotsky just created zone of proximal development and Brunner has said, okay, the way to go in the different into one zone to the other zone is using scaffolding. Finally, we also have, not finally, sorry, I have one more person. Gardner's theory is, has also contributed a lot to our practice because Gardner said that intelligence is not just one single entity. We don't have a general intelligence. We have multiple intelligences. So a child, could be very skilled in music, in linguistics, but the same child could be having some, some trouble perhaps in kinesthetic language, movement. Perhaps one child could be very good in visual knowledge and maybe they are like, how can I say, even from early age, they might be able to draw, paint, design things because they have a, incredible visual intelligence, but perhaps they're not really good with talking with other people, which is interpersonal, interpersonal intelligence. So Gardner has created our understanding that an intelligence is a very rich thing. And just because you're not very great in one area in life, doesn't mean you have an intelligence. We just know that every individual has a different set of skills makes them unique. And this actually feeds into the idea of unique child in EYFS. Every child is unique and every child has one talent, has one or more area of intelligence that they use more. Okay, so this feeds very much into the practice by emphasis over unique child. 
How about the famous theories that we keep covering in Level I? It's our famous, it's our favorite. <laughs> Bon van Brenner, he offered the ecological systems theory. And according to this theory, we now know that child is developing within a complex system of relationships. We don't see the child in isolation. We look at the child into systems of a family, a school, neighborhood, culture, society, everything happening in the, in, in, around the child is influencing the development of the child. So this is a very holistic approach. And his holistic approach to children highlighted the importance of children's participation in different environments. So a child's participation in a school environment, in family environment, in a play environment, is all going to be impacting the child's learning and development, which means all of them are important. Some of them are more important, as you can see in the graph, the ones in the microsystem, such as family or the nursery will be in the immediate environment. They will have a huge impact on the child because they're closer. But the things happening in our country, they will impact the child as well but more indirectly. Nevertheless, children is influenced by everything happening, even the changes over time. You see, that's why Born Feminist Theory has showed us, we don't only work with the children, we also work with the families and the schools and the teachers. Every, every significant person around the child is involved in our practice and pedagogy. Developmental perspectives that we covered are very helpful, but nevertheless, don't forget classic theories that we covered such as constructivism, um, such as the social constructivism, such as learning theories like social learning theory. They can offer insights. All of these theories offer insights, but sometimes they can be very reductionist. Don't forget the earlier pedagogy is more holistic. Seeing the child as a whole with body, mind, emotions, creativity, and social identity. I think Bron van Brenner's theory is more close to that understanding being very holistic. But the sad part is Bron van Brenner's theory doesn't focus so much about the details about the child's world, such as the mind, body, and emotions. So don't forget, even though we kind of borrowed concepts from Piaget, we borrowed concepts from Vygotsky, we borrowed concepts from Brunner. Just relying on one of them will not be enough because they explain only one or two things about the child. We need to see the children as holistic and seeing that different theories will help me with different parts of development and learning. What did we learn from these perspectives so far? Learning and behavior can be affected by a range of influences, transitions inside and outside the earlier setting. And the current legal requirements, policies, safeguarding will also impact the earlier practice. Follow, following the people like Piaget who offered some stages, we learned that we need to closely monitor the child and, and we have to have observation in order to understand, track children's activities. Thanks to behaviorist theories, we learned that we need to promote positive behavior, self-control, independence. Maybe sometimes we can use effective behavior management strategies like rewards or reinforcements that will help children to develop more. Children need to access the resources that enable exploration, experimentation, stimulation. This is something that pioneers and also some of the theories have already said to us. What did we learn from the ones who put more emphasis over social cultural context, such as like the Vygotsky, who said children learn in social settings, Brunner, Rogoff, Bronfenbrenner. 
these people put more emphasis over the social world. Adopting the social cultural perspective that these theories have gave us, they helped us to learn that children are influenced by the context. A child's development will be influenced by the school context. A child's development will be influenced by the family context or by the neighborhood. How learning varies with social cultural experiences. How learning and development could be different in different parts of the world. And how adults, other children, tools and resources can support and shape the learning. These things, the, we learn these things from social cultural perspectives. And we also learn that part of the process of growing for a child is using interaction, social interaction and dialogue. And how did we shape our practice and pedagogy today, thanks to these theories? Because some of the theories have said that we need to create social learning environments, now we have more emphasis over group work. We have more emphasis over scaffolding, guided participation, shared sustained thinking. We have more emphasis on the process of learning, how children learn, not just what they learn. We understood that diversity is very important and we need to create inclusive practices. We need to create relationships for children because we understood that relationships are very important thanks to the works of Bowlby and Ainsworth. A sense of belonging is very important. We also understood that thanks to social cultural ones like Vygotsky, Brunner, Rogoff, Bronfan Brenner, the way we assess children should be taking into account everything that is influencing the child. Thanks to these practices, thanks to these theories and the frameworks, we now know that we can challenge adult teacher-centered pedagogical practice, which focuses on simply transmitting the knowledge. We now moved away from adult teacher-centered pedagogy to child-centered, play-based, active participation, experiential learning. We try to create learning environments that offer rewarding and positive experiences and that are developmentally suitable and appropriate for practice. We also now know that we have policies that bind governments to make appropriate provisions for children. Those policies come from the pedagogical practices. Our pedagogical practice theorists fed into pedagogy and pedagogy created the policies we have today. One thing that those theories helped is creating those pedagogy policies, but also they, they created some, they unleashed some of the demons, <laughs> which is over relying on outcomes, quality indicators, over emphasis, over developmental standards, you know, expecting the child to be able to achieve things in the first two years. Why? Because we are following Piaget's stages. And if the child is lacking behind, oh, there's a problem. This created a very orthodox, very, how can I say, very reductionist approach. We do like EYFS framework, it's highly, but EYFS, don't forget, has highly informed, is highly informed by developmental perspective. And EYFS has also an emphasis over academic and cognitive development too. If you look at Ofsted, which is the inspecting institute that relies highly on quality indicators. Sure Start program also relies highly on quality indicators because they work with children who are lacking behind. Lacking behind in terms of these quality indicators. We judge the school settings, the practices, following certain set of criteria, assuming every one of them has to be exactly the same. 
So we are focusing on the learning outcomes too much. We are constantly assessing children and profiling children. We have norm checklists to assess children, whether children are able to do things in certain times. We evaluate children externally. So imagine a child is working with teachers and key persons for the whole year and somebody from outside who has no idea what's happening in the school comes and visits a couple of times and decides everything is going well in this setting. It's very external. And we have put so much over on the school readiness. Okay, so developmental perspectives have created good knowledge, have fed into our pedagogy, but they created also problems. They created very rigid assessments, too much reliance on outcomes, too much reliance on checklists, whether the children have progressed or not. What we need is we also need reliance to child rights perspective. We need to also understand that children um, are the holders of rights from word. And not the offset, we need to provide settings that meet the standards of child rights, not the offset rights. Every child matters and every child deserves the best possible start in life. So thanks to UNCRC, we have created this, we have now more focus on child rights into, in, in our pedagogical practices. Child rights perspective and UNCRC have created our knowledge about the fact that children have rights. Children are holders of rights from birth. This is also contributing to our pedagogy. Why? Because thanks to that practice, Thanks to UNCRC, thanks to children's rights, we value children's opinions more, we listen to them more, we act on them more. We support children uh, in, in articulating their, themselves, we support children in being unique and diverse. We know importance of maturational factors, providing healthy environments, providing nutrition, as well as a, a rich, social and cultural context to child where they can have education and enjoyment. And thanks to UNCRC, you know, we are now working on partnership with families in the settings because we know that families, communities have some obligations towards children. That's why as practitioners, we will work with families because we are aware that children have certain rights. Okay, guys, so, this is pretty much 